All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today. Nothing is into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. We hope that you enjoy. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Hello, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. This is episode 354. I'm Ken, I'll be your host. And uh, joining me as usual, or joining the show as usual, is Lonnie Lonnie. St. Louis and Mark, Marcus Almighty. Greetings. <laughs> um, so there's a spot missing this week. So the chains are off, folks. We're, we're, <laughs> we're going to run wild and loose here. If you hit stop now, we understand. <laughs> yeah, if you hit stop, we totally understand because we're missing an essential person. Uh, of this podcast, our supreme leader, Julian. So anyway, hopefully he's not working too hard. Um, he probably is, but hopefully it's not too bad for him today. Um, all right. So what we got today, um, before we go over uh, a topic and we're going to hit a topic and then we're going to do some board topics after that. Um, what's in the news? Um, I think we know the Kiss is going to do the Tribeca. I think it's called Tribeca. Tribeca. Uh, B-B. Tribeca. Tribeca. Okay. Yeah. In uh, New York, um, after a special screening of that uh, uh, documentary there, um, so that'll be interesting to see how they how they do how if they're, if they're a little rusty or anything like that, and what what songs they play on. I guess it's going to be probably a short set. Um, that they're going to do. I was going to ask you that actually. Do you think it's going to be a one of these like, you know, thirty minute things, or do you think they're going to actually try to do something a little bit longer? What, what's your gut instinct? I I think it's going to be a, just an appearance, more or less, and it's just kind of a short a short set. I, I again, I don't know how many songs. Maybe five songs. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I could be totally wrong. I haven't heard anything else about it about how long they're going to play or supposed to play. Lonnie, you hear anything? No, we really haven't heard anything other than the announcement last week. But I I don't know. I, I would I would expect, you know, half hour, forty five minute max type set, you know, five, maybe six songs, just like a, a miniature set. I mean I don't know. I I don't I don't know what to expect. I, quite, I, quite frankly, you know? Yeah, I mean I kind of think think of it as, you know, when you you guys obviously have the kissologies, right? And you know the one where they have uh they show the Detroit Rock City premiere and they played uh-huh. at that where it was only like four, five songs, maybe something like that. hmm Yeah. It, it it could be very well that I think that's what's gonna be, something like that. Um but, you know, prove us wrong. <laughs> we'll see. The more the better. The more they do the better, I think sure. it'd be good. Um, so that's one thing uh, we all know about uh, the there's been those claim auctions Paul Stanley has signed a whole bunch of stuff albums and and, and acetates uh, mm. even um, that uh, the elder acetate um, world without heroes I think that went for about I'm trying to remember how much that went for Seven two million dollars. It, it went. It went for a lot. Maybe it was five thousand fifty three. I don't know what it was, yeah. but it was a good chunk of money uh, for that. And then uh, there's another one too. Um, I think there's another acetate that's gonna. It's going on right now, but I can't remember now what it is. Um, you know, the funny thing about the acetates is that I know they're old. Like, I mean, the, the elder ones, obviously eighty one. You know, it's yeah. way back. And technically, the whole thing with the acetate is that once they listen to it and they approve it they can take it to a pressing plant they do their little process to it and they make you know vinyls off of it I, i've always wondered if you take something that old and try to make a stamper out of it if it would work because people say you know if you, the longer you leave it the more degradation happens and stuff mm-hmm. like that right i've always wondered if somebody would maybe you know because if it gets in the wrong hands and somebody you know goes to some corrupted plant somewhere in France or somewhere in the back alley and gets it pressed, you know, if it would actually work, you know? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I, I'm going to guess it holds up pretty good. I think it's, it's more, well, how you take care of it, but, uh, 
if you play it, you're not supposed to play it a bunch because that's yeah. that's going to rip it apart. Right. Um, I doubt yeah. Paul played it, you know, like every day. He played it over and over <laughs> to hear, hear it. It hasn't been played in 40 years. <laughs> i got to hear my ass. He probably today. played it once, if that even. He may have not ever even played it. And, right. So, yeah. So that's that's another thing there. Um, so some cool stuff. It's kind of it's kind of pricey to, you know, uh, bid on or claim those things because they're starting out, you know, to claim the Paul Stanley uh, 2014 release signed by him for 200 bucks. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it's somewhat pricey. Uh, not everyone has 200 bucks to throw around. Um, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing, I, I don't know what else going on in the news other than we all know about the uh, soundboard thing. Um, I was just surprised that it was still for sale. Still uh, available? On, on at least, yeah, still available on Kiss Online, where some of these other albums have uh, come and gone. Like, we remember uh, Double Platinum had the double albums. A couple different, mm -hmm. couple variations of that. And those sold out. Both of those sold out pretty quick. Yeah, but very quickly. But yeah. those are also picture discs, which they weren't ever done before, right? True. In that fashion. And you got to also remember too. You we brought uh, before we started. We mentioned to each other that people might have this in various forms. Like there's been bootleg videos of it, yeah. and essentially the audio is going to be similar to those concerts. Maybe just polished up a little bit more, obviously in studio. But people might have various forms of this as well right, right. so it, it's possible what, what are your thoughts Lonnie well I I think that you know the other ones were reissues and this being a new release I think that well you know m maybe there's more of these being pressed you know maybe there's a bigger a larger yeah, maybe you know they, they may have just printed a larger quantity of these being that it's a new release as opposed to just another reissue that um, is true. so yeah. I, I think that's plausible as well that's a that's a very very good point because the other ones were on such a limited number right that's why they probably sold out mm -hmm. people panicked and bought five and six copies of them just in case just to not run out of them and this one could be a lot bigger amount it's just like i don't know if you guys follow this uh thing that's happening with the uh, uh with these other companies that are releasing and reissuing mm -hmm. jazz albums they're re-releasing uh uh miles davis kind of blue on this uhqr vinyl Hmm. for a hundred bucks but they pressed twenty five thousand copies of it in the first run of six thousand sold out in like the one day like they were getting caught they were getting sales wow. every seven seconds on their website for it so i mean if you make a bigger amount of them then obviously they won't sell out as quickly as if you make a five thousand print run right yeah that's a good point um yeah well i guess there's a lot of Miles Davis fans out there, obviously, um, too. Um, I mean, pro and plus, yeah. Dress to Kill, sorry, Ken. Dress right. to Kill, for example, was one of the ones that sold out pretty quickly, that reissue. And mm -hmm. it's still one of the ones that you see on Kiss My Wax sites. There, people, everybody asking for it. Somebody want to trade me for it? Somebody want to trade me for it? Because nobody, that's so, be people seem to have missed out on that one for well, some that's reason. Because, yeah. Well, the reason is because they, that's when COVID happened, right in the middle of it, or started. It came and, out in the middle and of And they March, shut everything well, down. Sure. And they had only pressed 300 and stopped, around 300 really? or so. Yep. So that, that that's why I've heard. I've heard 300, I've heard 500, but I think it's more around 300 or so. Wow. Uh, copies. I did get a copy. Oh, well, you're lucky. One. I was it's lucky. Only, it's the only colored one I don't have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, people were kind of <laughs> upset about that one. Um, but, you know, a great selling point of this uh, on the soundbar, as Julian mentioned last week, is that cat sphincter um, pressing. <laughs> yeah color press who doesn't want that yeah i know see that's the, maybe that's why it's not selling because it's kind of like the way he looks he goes you know it doesn't look <laughs> maybe julian jinxed it julian jinxed it for them you know every maybe. time you look might, out, you think you of know, julian's comments about the yeah. sphinx so a lot of those things look better in person so we'll just go by that uh, <laughs> we hope we hope it looks better in person uh, it doesn't look so bad <clears throat> all right so any other news you got? Nothing? Uh, no, I think that's about it. I mean, you guys seem to be on top of the news. I'm kind of Not overrun really. with stuff. European tour is still on, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that, oh, that's yeah. another thing. It's interesting that you brought that up. So just really quickly before we start, 
gut feelings. I'm very curious. You think it's going to happen or you think it's not going to happen? The... I don't think the European tour happens. I, I think there's a decent chance that the run that they have scheduled for late summer and to fall in the U.S., I think there's a possibility that that ha- a higher percentage that that happens than a European tour at this point, you know, with more and more people getting a vaccine and the numbers going mm-hmm. down mm-hmm. and college football stadiums and NFL stadiums saying they want to pack people in in the fall. Well, if we can, if we're planning on doing that in the fall, why can't we have a concert in the fall? So I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think there's a, a much larger percentage of a possibility of something like that happening. So, so um, your gut feeling says yes. My gut feeling says yes. My gut feeling says that, that, mm-hmm. um, that it, it, that it will happen. I'm going to be optimistic. Mr. Not the, not the European, not the European tour, but I, I, the, my gut feeling is that the U.S. leg will happen. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, U.S. leg. Hmm. Interesting. I, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, European, no. Um, I know they're supposed to play what, the download. I know they're going to play the download festival or something like that, right? That's in, yeah, that's in England, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and then that makes me wonder if they are going to do, but I don't think so. The other, the other, uh, other ones. As for the U.S., um, yeah, maybe. I, I, I don't know. I, I say things are trending in that direction at least. Yeah, yeah, there's a uh, lot of artists you know, where, going on, starting to kick in tours now. Where is this? I mean, I like um, Me- Megadeth just announced a tour that's that's happening in the fall. Yeah. I mean, I think I think there's a possibility that it happens. You know, whereas this time last year we're sitting here talking about it. You know, and and there were and there were dates scheduled for a late summer fall run for mm-hmm. Kiss. You know, and. and there's no way it was going to happen. So I, I, I feel much more optimistic about, about this happening. You know, it's, it's the beginning of May, you know, by, yeah. by, the, by the beginning of August, things might be a lot different. You know, let, let's hope things keep trending in that direction. Yeah. Well, it seems like a lot of people are getting the uh, vaccine now. I, from the news that I see here in Canada, they're saying that the United States has quite a lot of people vaccinated and more every day are getting done. So it's very possible that that could happen. What I'm curious about is, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but then they already book as well a, a, a string of dates in Australia too. In November, yeah. So I I, I'm guessing that, that that might that may happen because I'm yeah. I'm guessing they have theirs pretty good under control from the last time that I heard. I could be wrong again, but yeah, from what I've heard, I heard that they're okay. So maybe that may happen. Maybe U.S. and Australia will be what happens. Yeah, you know? Australia's oh. been in real good shape for quite yeah, a I, while. Yeah, I, I think that I think there's a really high percentage chance of that. Yeah. Happens. Yeah. All right. I'd bet on that one. Well, there's right. the news, ladies and gentlemen. And they have the news. All right. So starting off, <laughs> we'll start with a topic that I came up with that um, regarding your favorite or what you think is the best first side of an album. You know, we're thinking like a Kiss album or cassette, you know, uh, like back in the old days uh, where it's split in, in two. You have a side one, side two. Um, side one, what's the best Kiss side one of all their albums, studio albums? And then what is the best side two um, for you? Um, there's no right or wrong on it. Um, I, I personally was surprised. What's your favorite picked... side one? Let's go. Let's do our side one. Yeah, so let's, let's do our start side one. with the what's side your one. Okay, yeah. So I was kind of surprised that my pick, and you, you probably call me a sellout or something on that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't. What surprised me is I didn't go with my favorite album, you know. So which is kind of surprising. So I went with uh, for side one. I picked Kiss debut album. I I, pick, yeah. I picked that because. I think, I mean, yeah, the production may not be great, but those are just all really, really solid tunes on there. Um, you know, starting Strutter, Nothing to Lose, Firehouse, Cold Gin, and then, yeah. uh, was it Let Me Know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and yes, and Let Me Know is kind of one of those uh, sleeper kind of great it's songs. A deep cut. Yeah, it's a deep cut, but it's, and it's a great song still. It's there's no kind of. I don't think anything is filler, at least on side one of the first album. Um, no, that's the way I feel. Um, 
So that's why I picked that one, and I was kind of surprised. And I went through it. I looked at okay, I'm looking next album, next album. I was like, no, yeah. doesn't really, you know, it's close. Some are really close, but then I just went ahead with uh, their debut, which should be a lot of the good songs anyway, because we've talked about that where you know, you've had the artist has had all their life to write these songs, and mm-hmm. uh, and so usually it's pretty hot right. off the first first album. All right, so. Who's next? Mark? Mark, go next. Okay. So, I'll be honest. At first, I thought about the same album at first. I was thinking, hmm, that album's really good. It has a really strong first side. But then another album hit me, and it's not what you're thinking. It's not Rock and Roll Over, which is my favorite album. It's not that one. Okay. In fact, this record I've been listening to the last couple of days off and on while I've been downstairs doing various things like packing records and stuff, and... Well, I listened to this, I realized to myself, this is a really, really awesome first side of a record. Now that we were talking about doing this, I, it re-hit me again. And that is the Paul Stanley 78 solo album, Side A. I think that whole Side A of that album is absolutely great. Tonight You Belong to Me, Move On, Ain't Quite Right, Wouldn't You Like to Know Me, Take Me Away, Perfect. Those songs, to me, are absolutely stellar Stuff. Now, did I say? Did I say? Mark's non, not playing by the Did I say non solo? Non. Mark's not no. playing by the rules. Okay. Yeah, I did. But, and, and, anyway, <laughs> on the board, on the board, I said. I'll, I'll argue this because because oh, we fine. had this argument before where we were saying, does a Kiss solo record constitute a Kiss album release? And we all agreed that it I does. I count. I count. Yes, it's a Kiss album that, release because they put that it's they a put Kiss, the Kiss album release. Right? They originally weren't going to do that, um, but they. Yeah, they changed that too. Now, if the, now if that wasn't the case, I could pick a different one. But I, I thought that no, that was, you know, what would be your second? Just to what, just yeah, what would be your second? What would be your non solo destroyer? Right? No, no, <laughs> destroy. Yeah, right away that one. Uh, no, um, actually, when I when I thought about that, another one that I thought was really really good, a side A of Creatures of the Night. That one's really mm-hmm. been a side that I really enjoyed as well. I mean, I've always loved that album from beginning to end. You know, I've always thought Side B was really good too, but I, I'm mm. not into some of the tracks as strongly as I am on Side A, right? Okay. I mean, even songs like, you know, Rock and Roll Hell, when I saw them do that on the uh, Kiss Cruise, when the footage came out of them playing that, that really bumped up my appreciation of that song mm-hmm. much more. Because I was like, song. wow, they, they actually played that really good live, you know, so... If I, if I if my solo one is disqualified, then I would go with the creatures of the night okay. side A. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll let you we'll let you do the Paul Stanley side one. That's thank, good. Thank you, sir. Thank You're thank allowed. You. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. So, Lonnie, what's what's yours? Well, those are both really good choices, and I was gonna go with the original album as well, just mm. because song for song it is really good but for the sake of being different and for the sake of having a discussion um it's not fun for us for two of us to choose the same one i'm gonna say and mark's not gonna like it but i'm gonna say destroyer side one Ooh. because just just for, you know it is song for song go through it detroit rock city king of the nighttime world god of thunder and then great expectations is, is good too despite you know what your, your thoughts on, on Bob Ezra's production on the album. Song for song, those are three of the four are core Kiss songs. Just like Ken picked the original album, mm-hmm. those are core Kiss songs. And just like that original album, a lot of people are fans because of this release and because of those mm-hmm. songs. They're such a staple in their catalog. And like here, the, the first time I saw the band on the reunion tour, they played three of these four songs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and and on to Ken's point, I mean, the first time I, I saw the band in 96, they played Strutter. They didn't play Nothing to Lose, but they played Firehouse. They played Cold Gin. They played three of those five songs. So, I mean, those, those are just core core songs in the catalog so i'm gonna say destroyer aside one just for the fact of 
the meaning that those songs have had for the band since its release. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And just to 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 defend myself in one manner, <laughs> it's that I, I I have nothing I have I have nothing wrong with you picking that side A, and because like I said before, I don't have anything against the songs themselves because on Alive 2 I really like some of the versions of those songs like God of Thunder and I love the version of Detroit Rock City on those live albums it's just I always had an issue with the way they sounded on that album not the songs themselves just the way that they were done produced by Bob so I can understand totally that you picked those songs in side A as a possibly perfect side A hmm. well, alright interesting well yeah thanks for picking something different <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean but, but we're, I, we were on the same wavelength there though for, for that yeah you know. the same reasons though for the same reasons oh yeah definitely definitely all right so let's get to uh favorite side twos um all right here's another one this this one you may call <laughs> i went through all the side twos and there were some really good ones and i thought oh maybe i should pick that but I went with Kiss, Dressed to Kill, um, cause again, maybe they're not all played live in concert or anything like that, but they're, they're just great songwriting and really great songs. So, come on and love me. Obviously, everyone we see, everyone seems to love that song anyway. Um, anything for my baby is really good. I really like she. I mean, yeah, it's a real slow kind of plotting kind of thing, but I, I really like it. I've always liked she. I always thought it was a really cool song. Um, Love Raw I Can, another great, you know, um, Paul Stanley, you know, poppy kind of writing song. And then, hey, Rock and Roll All Night. I mean, that is the song you know, that they, they play at every show. Um, and there's a reason because it's, well, it's an anthem, but... It's their signature song, and when I first heard it, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, we get sick of it, you know. I was like, oh, I don't want to hear that again. But when they make their appearances on every, uh, when they're on a TV show or whatever appearance, it's always rock and roll all night, uh, most <laughs> of the time. Um, but it's just a great, well-written song, and it's kind of a song that's kind of came together by magic. I don't want to say that word, but anyway... <laughs> that's that's how I feel about that song. So, yeah, Just to Kill Side 2 for me um, does it. Interesting. Very interesting. Excellent. Excellent pick. Yeah. So, for me, and I'll be I'll just preface this by saying it's not a solo album this time for Side B. Well, it, it is a it is no, it is a proper studio release and this one came to me right, like right away. Like right right when you said it, I and I'll and I'll tell you why because Okay. When I listened to side A of this record the first couple of times when I first heard the album years and years ago, I was never really too hip at first to side A. But, you know, my sister always would flip the record, obviously, after and play side two. And I remember the first couple of times I heard side two, I was like, yeah, just, I got into it much more. And then years later when I got it on CD, the backside of that album had always connected with me much hmm. stronger to the point of where on one of my records, my own records, I covered one of the songs on side two <clears throat> as part of the uh, bonus songs that I did. I and I'm talking that. about uh, yeah. Dynasty side yeah. two. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> I did, that's a great side two. <laughs> yeah, because I did, I did Charisma as, as a cover on one of that's my right. bonus songs, right? And uh, yeah. so, I mean, come on, Charisma, great... one of Gene's great songs that he did. Magic Touch, I've always loved that song. Yeah. I wish they would have done that live as a band, you know? Uh, and two fantastic ace songs, Hard Times and Save Your Love. And then X-Ray Eyes is a song that's been often overlooked for Gene Simmons people who are fans of Gene's of singing. But I love X-Ray Eyes. I think it's a really good song. Catchy. It's got a good chorus to it. You know, and his singing is really, really strong, I think, on it. Those two songs from Gene on that side are really well-written songs. So I've always thought that side two just absolutely beat the crap out of side a in my opinion of dynasty yeah i agree with that i mean yes yeah, that's kind of my side one for dynasty of course that's true you know that uh, but it's 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 yeah charisma um magic like you said and, and so on they're all 
well, they're all really solid songs. And yeah, I know it. I, when I looked at side two of that, I thought, ooh, this is pretty, <laughs> pretty strong. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I think I only did it because it, you know, maybe wasn't, uh, you know, it was too polished, a little bit more yeah. polished. That is, I think that's the only what reason I didn't give it, you know, the didn't nod. connect with you as much. Maybe not as much, yeah. But uh, yeah, I I agree though. It's it's a it's a great side too. It all the way through. So well, Lonnie. I was gonna pick Press to Kill side two. <laughs> wow, Lonnie and I are on the same. You and I are on the same. Sorry, Lonnie. You should have went but, first. So then I'm <laughs> sitting here, sitting here looking. What else is a good side too? Are you guys are talking? <laughs> <laughs> so we can have a discussion and not just oh yeah you're right that's right that's right. it's okay you move on so what else is a really good side tune and i thought about dynasty dynasty is really good and mark goes i'm gonna pick dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. so just for the wow. sake of discussions just so we can talk about some other things this is just everybody just agreeing because that's not fun i'm gonna go with rock and roll over yeah which is an excellent side too as well love yeah. them mr speed seeing your dreams hard luck woman and making love those are mm -hmm. those are great great songs and mo and underrated underrated songs in my opinion too they don't i don't think it, it gets the love it deserves everybody loves rock and roll you do if you did a Most poll people. on the board yeah. tomorrow and said you know what's your favorite kiss record rock and roll over might win yeah um, and there's and there's a good chance it would, but I I think they're underrated maybe by the band that that we don't we don't hear Love Em Lee we don't hear Mr. Speed we don't hear these songs from the band which mm -hmm. is a shame and, and never never heard these songs from the band not not pre reunion not post reunion not not in not in their heyday in the seventies that they really pay much attention to these songs the only songs mm -hmm. the only song I, and I know Hard Luck Woman is on Alive too but the, the only song that they've really of these, the really only song of these songs on side two that they've really played on a consistent basis, halfway consistent basis anyway, is Making Love, yeah. which is a which is a great song. Oh, which yeah. is a great song. But there's other songs on there that are mm -hmm. that are that don't get the love they deserve by the band. I think they get the love they deserve from the fans. Like fans love Mr. Speed. Fans love oh, Love yeah. and Leave Them. Yeah. Uh, but I don't I don't think the band appreciates them as much as the fans do and side two of rock and roll over is really really strong and mm -hmm. just the sound of rock and roll over you know doesn't suck either so that kind of puts it up there as well. yeah that's i mean that was close for me too i i thought about it i thought oh man that side two is really really good and, and you know i don't know i thought well is it you know, is it perfect? <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect, but uh, I think "Dress to Kill" is the choice. So I, I think you got what "Dress yeah, to Kill." But, yeah, songs, songs but it, it was a close good. second. You know that. You know, like you said, you know, "Dynasty" was close to. There's a lot of very close, and usually it's only the reason I didn't pick one here or there is because there's just one song that's not that just doesn't fit in with the others, or mm -hmm. or is, is kind of a little on the lower side is more of a semi filler but also looking at all these albums and looking at all the sides it made me think man they have a lot of great songs and there's yeah. really not a lot of filler out there on all their albums especially yeah. the early you know 20 years first 20 years or whatever i mean there's a lot of great songs that are just unappreciated i think yeah I mean, and then it's an excellent point that Lonnie brought up that Making Love is really the only song off of Side B that's been consistently played by, or at least somewhat consistently in the 70s by mm -hmm. them, right? And I mean, you know, songs like, you know, Love Em, Leave Em, such a great song. I mean, they they played it on that, uh you know, that television show when they did those three songs there. Oh, yeah. uh, they played they played it in 06 on that Japanese little tour that they, that they did. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's a, nice, there's a nice little bootleg of that, but just not doesn't get the love it deserves though yeah it's, it's fans yeah. like i said if you were to do a poll if we were to put a poll up and say what's your favorite kiss album rock and roll over would probably win mm -hmm. yeah. and we just, we just looked at half the album and the mm -hmm. band has basically ignored it live since yeah. since it came out and i mean especially mr speed i mean that's such a great song i mean it 
why that's been ignored is beyond me and even see you in your dreams it's it's not a very long song they can stick that in anywhere in the set and people would probably go insane if they played it you know yeah but according to paul the, the people just want to hear the hits Only just <laughs> yeah. the hits i just want just to play the hits <laughs> and most of the songs they play were never hits or not that's... released as a single um yeah most of, yeah <laughs> i just want to play the songs i like to play it's basically what it is yeah, 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 exactly. That, I think that's the main thing that we're skimping over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we're gonna play the hits, play forever. Hope we don't play that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's there's no side three, so we can't do a side three on these, um, unfortunately. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the Elder was not a double album, and you know stuff like that. So, all right. Well, I mean, I'm sure What's there's a lot of. Side? Yeah, is, is, I mean, was everyone else's favorite, favorite, favorite side? side? Yeah, when we, when uh, you hear this, and what is yours? Yeah, what is your favorite size? Just post it up on the on the board. What what works for you as the best side one and best side two? All right, next, I think we don't have any planned topics, but we can go through some any topics on the boards or topics that you have in my yeah you have one i i I may have one that might be interesting to talk about yeah go ahead ahead. that's interesting i saw it on the board and i and i found this uh an interesting topic i i might modify it slightly Mm -hmm. but what it is was on the board they were talking about ghost musicians right Mm -hmm. that appeared on kiss records now what i'm going to say you know the ghost musicians are people that perform on records and don't get credited Credit. on the record for their performance. Yeah. Now, what I'd like to talk about is what who do you think is your favorite a uh, ghost musician? And one further, who do who do you think is probably one of the most important to kiss history as being a, a ghost musician? I'll, I'll start with mine so you can get an idea of what I mean. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I would pick, I would pick like my favorite one first. I would pick Anton Fig because I loved his drum performances on Dynasty and on Unmasked. I thought that he did a great job with that. Unmasked, I think they let him go a little bit more. His style didn't make it so much like Peter Chris. Like, I think at that point he said, do whatever you want, because look at Torpedo Girl. That Nobody would have believed that's Peter Chris drumming that style, no. right? So I think that he's one of my favorite ghost players as far as you know that goes. But I think as far as importance... I think one of the most important people for sure were the guys that appeared on Creatures of the Night, like Michael Yab, the guy who played bass for Gene on on those sessions there. Because if you think about it, in the according to the book, it said that Gene was so distraught. I don't know how he could be distraught, but he was so <laughs> flustered by the breakup of him and Diana Ross at that time that he didn't want to play on the record. He sang, but they said that this Michael Yap guy came in and he went and played bass, and he just said, here, play it. And he he played and tracked some of the songs on bass. And mm-hmm. I love the, the bass sound on that album. Whatever he did to play on there was, was just really fantastic. So, you know, if he didn't do those things, maybe we wouldn't even have gotten a Creatures of the Night album. Who knows, you know? I mean, I, I think it's an interesting thing to think about, like what what kind of impact these people have, right, as far as the history of the Kiss albums, right? Well, when you're talking about mm-hmm. ghost musicians and you talk about creatures, well, is is Vinny a, a ghost musician on on Creatures of the Night? I mean, yeah, in a way, he's not on the cover. Yeah, he, exactly. I, mean, I I think you'd have to put him in if you're going to talk ghost musicians and talk Creatures of the Night. Yeah, that that's a rabbit hole you can really go down as far as, far as that topic goes. Because I, I, I if you're going to talk ghost musicians tonight, you have to you have to put Vinny on there because considering they put Ace on the cover. And wasn't yeah. the uh, when Creatures of the Night the song? Was it Steve Ferris? Is that it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Played, played that uh, guitar solo there. So, yeah, there's a lot on there, at least on that one. Um, but, yeah, you picked uh, Anton for, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, that, <laughs> that's a good pick because they tried to, at least on Dynasty for sure, they they were hiding that there were, you know, there was nobody filling in. Um Mm-hmm. I think it kind of came out during or after Unmasked came out 
there was something about I think people realized it wasn't Peter uh, Peter's drumming it didn't sound the same as what he normally does so um, yeah Lonnie do you have any uh, um, favorite ghost musicians from favorite ghost musicians you know I, I think you have to include Bob Hulick in there yes um, for his contributions on especially on Alive 2 and the work he did on those four new killer songs it mm -hmm. at, at minimum his contribution on on those two albums I mean people talk about those people love those those songs off of the studio side on Alive 2 um, and they and, and rightfully so they're they're very good they're very good songs at least four of the five of them are, are really fantastic um, granted, he didn't play on, on Rocket Ride, but his contributions on Rocket in the USA and and All American Man and Larger Than Life, I mean, it those are really really good songs. And then what he what he did for for Killers as well. So I put Bob Kulick in there as, as far as um, important as far as coming in and and cranking out those songs in in seventy seven when when Kiss is at its height comes in and as a ghost musician and keeps keeps that momentum that the band had rolling and then in 82 mm -hmm. at, at a different point in the band's yeah. um life where they're they're kind of struggling he comes in and and plays guitar on some on some really good tracks to kind of kickstart the band again at a very different role and, and by the time killers came around you know they kind of told him you know you, you you don't have to play like ace at this point yeah and they gave they gave him a little they gave him a little more a little more leash is like like we have today without Julian reining us in. So, <laughs> um, so I, I think Bob has to be put in that conversation because he he played an intricate role at two very different stages mm -hmm. for the band. Yeah, I I have to strongly agree with that. I think that his uh, performances, especially on songs like Larger in Life, is just mm -hmm. unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, anytime you hear people talking about Side Four, that's one of the first songs that everybody brings up. Oh, the drums are amazing. It's like Bonham, and then those leads are incredible. And for a long time, people were talking about it as if Ace was involved in it back in the 70s. And then, you know, only, only years later did we find out that this is Bob Kulik, who was on here doing these amazing guitar solos, you know? I remember that's one of the first things I heard when I started listening to podcast, they did one of those little segments, those in the uh, Devereaux's dungeon there, or whatever it's called, they played the demos of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a, an early version of that song with totally different leads that Bob did in the song. Mm -hmm. And even those alternate guitar solos that he did were just unbelievably gr good. Like he had such a good feel for it. It's not unbelievable to think that this guy was running neck and neck in the auditions back in 73 to be one of the guys to actually join kiss you know oh yeah i mean uh i it's funny that you talk about that song um larger than life and but then there's the you know the drum you say bottom some people thought that that was a, a ghost drummer too but mm. i mean oh, yeah. i think gene has said that no that's peter peter played on yeah. that or whatever and i think peter even probably said so too um, but so yeah, it was a different sound for for Kiss at least big drums until at least uh, Creatures <laughs> yeah. that was the biggest drum. So yeah, so uh, I agree with both of those for sure. Um, here's one you kind of kind of find maybe peculiar. Um, uh, ghost musician. Uh, my ghost musician will be Tommy Thayer <laughs> on, Psycho on, Circus. on Psycho Circus. <laughs> I, I was thinking he's gonna say Tommy Thayer or Kevin Valentine. Say one <laughs> yeah, of the two. yeah, Kevin Valentine. Yeah, I. You know what? I I did think about Kevin Valentine, but uh, uh, which perfectly solid drummer, you know. Um, yeah. Great, um, great drummer, but uh, yeah, I thought you know Tommy Thayer. I mean, he pulled off trying to you know fake us out, um, you know, being Ace and playing mm -hmm. like trying to play like Ace. Um, um, and he did a pretty pretty good job on that one so he you know he he's solid he's a solid you know performer um and uh yeah so i'll give it i'll give it to him that's probably what got, got him the job um <laughs> and, and yeah, down the road the day, yeah. you know you passed the audition so that was that one all right we got that one all right i got one for you guys all right what is one thing 
that you've completely changed your mind on about Kiss. Like an album that came out that you loved it when it first came out and you hate it now or the other way around or a member you really liked back in the day that you can't stand now or, or the other way around. Is, is there one thing that you've kind of... Mm, maybe maybe I was wrong about about my hatred or my love for this. That's a tough one. And I'll go first while you guys think. Okay. Okay. Mine is Psycho Circus. Mm. I loved Psycho Circus, the album, not the song. I loved the song. I still like the song. Yeah. But I loved that album when it came out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely yeah. loved it. And I and and I remember reading on the internet and on the Kiss FAQ message. Maybe it was I mean, it was at Kiss FAQ in '98. But I remember reading on message boards in '98. Might have been Asylum. Asylum had a message board back in '90 because Asylum had a message board back in '98. It's probably on there. Reading that, it's not Ace and Peter. Blah blah blah. And my 19 year old self didn't want to believe it. And I said, "No, that's Ace Frehley. I don't care what anybody says." I mean, again, back to what Ken's point about Tommy Thayer. You know that that's Ace Frehley. I don't care. You know, I saw the band twice in that reunion tour. They were having fun. You know, this this mm-hmm. this is the album I've been waiting my literally my whole life for. I loved Psycho Circus when it came out. And I did for several years afterwards too. And it wasn't until um two thousand four on the Rock the Nation tour, um, my I was gonna go with to the show with my brother and he said, Um, you know, bur- burn me burn me some of your kiss CDs. I need you know, I, I need some more I need some more stuff to listen to. So I, one of the CDs I burned him was Psycho Circus. And I said, did you just listen to that? He goes, yeah. He goes, that's terrible. I go, what are you talking about? I go, what are you talking about? It's great. And he goes, Lonnie, that's awful. So I went back and listened to it a little more objectively. And he ruined Psycho Circus for me that day. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, Todd? You're right. It's not very good. <laughs> so <laughs> that that is definitely one of them. And, and you know, I I listen. I mean, I listen to you like the song you wanted the best. You got the best. And like I listen to it now. I'm like, oh, that's just cringeworthy. How how did I like this for that many years after it came out? I'm like, oh, so no. Psycho Circus is one of those albums for me that I I almost cannot even listen to because of of like his reaction to me having to go back and, you know, take my, my kiss sunglasses off, you know, and, 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 and really listen to it objectively. And I, he, he ruined me that album for me. Wow. So what do you guys got? Oh, oh no. I'll tell you one thing that's really, that has changed for me. And this is something that's changed for me sort of, in a, in a long-term basis with me when i first got into kiss like years back like you guys i kind of looked at kiss as being a very you know very cool band they had a great stage show but i never took them seriously as musicians i always thought of them as like yeah whatever you know three chords and a couple of solos on top and I, you know these guys aren't like a rush or they're not like a yes you know i never took them anything seriously that way but as the years have gone by and I've gotten to see them do stuff on their own individually, like for example, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's a really cool thing on the YouTube where Paul Stanley is doing a segment for GHS strings. I think it is where he's just sitting there by himself with his Les Paul talking about rhythm guitar playing and how, you know, he's used GHS strings his whole life. Right. Mm. But you know, and he's sitting there playing all these kiss songs and playing by himself and, you know, it started to dawn on me, like, this guy's a really, really good guitar player, you know, you know, more than how I thought back in the day where I thought, you know, whatever, this guy's just gent- dancing around and showboating. He ain't that good. And and really, the same thing for Gene. I used to think that Gene was a complete hack on the bass. But, you know, when you see segments of him playing by himself sometimes, or when you see him playing with that, uh, he, he went out with that uh, that band, remember, with Joe Elliott and a couple of these other guys, oh, yeah, and they just yeah. played in South America. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He played really good on bass. And even when he they played on the Revenge Tour, that Revenge Tour 
really opened my eyes for how good those guys could be as a unit together musically. You know, they were very tight. Gene played some awesome bass on that tour. And I think the biggest thing that has changed for me over the years with Kiss is my view of them as musicians. Because like I said, when I first got into them before, if somebody would have went to me and said, hey, uh, what do you think of Kiss as a band? I would have never have mentioned that. I thought that they were great musicians, you know? Sure. I, I, I'm not going to ever put them in, a, in like some category with, you know, you know, some upper echelon, like shredders. And I thought that, that's not the point. They're great players. They do what they do really well. They're good songwriters. And I think Gene doesn't get enough credit for his bass playing. That's mm-hmm. for damn sure. He's a really good bass player, you know, and, and even Ace. I mean, Ace does what he yeah. does very well. His solo records that he does, his playing, it's it's very well done. His playing on all the solo records of late has been fantastic. So I think as players, they've really opened my eyes to kind of acknowledge the fact that they are a lot better than I thought when I was, you know, 18, you know, or 16 years old when I first started listening to these guys. So that was that was a big, you know, thing for me to realize about the band. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, yeah, a lot of people, I'm sure, felt the same way as you. Um, about uh, you know, especially like Fairweather people or people who like other bands think, oh, these guys, they're just all yeah, it's costumes and the big show that, but they don't know. Mm-hmm. They can't write a song and they can't play their instruments, you know, it's, and stuff like that. So, yeah, they they've proved that they can do it. I mean, they, they wouldn't have lasted that long, right? Had, yeah, <laughs> if they well, really I mean... did suck. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think yeah. the, I think the problem is, is that when you hear songs like Rock and Roll Night, for example, sure. it's such a simple, you know, three, four chord song. But then people forget that they have songs like King of the Mountain and songs that have much more complex parts to it, and much mm-hmm. more guitar intricacies than, than that, those kind of songs. If you just look back on those kind of songs and yeah, maybe you might think that they're not that capable as musicians. But mm-hmm. if you dig deep into their catalog, there's a lot of songs in there that show you that they know what they're doing. Right. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one, Mark. I I agree with you there. Um, another one, I guess. Uh, oh, I didn't give you mine. What, no, no. What, I, I, you know, it's it's kind of hard for me to pick. I, I guess the thing is, um, I have a different view on on the '96 reunion than I did. You know, I thought, mm-hmm. well, when it, when it happened. I thought it was going to be the you know the greatest thing since sliced bread or and all that kind of stuff because I thought yeah it's going to be just like seventy seven and and it it wasn't I mean yeah it was in the fact that they put on the you know the makeup and the band was together and they played all the tunes that, that they would play back in the seventies or whatever um, but. It was kind of a lit down, and I don't know if that's. <laughs> I think I was more excited back then about it uh, than I am looking back at it now. At least the concert itself, thinking that yeah, it was not as energetic and as exciting as it probably would have been had I saw them in '77. Um, I'm not, I know I saw them in '79, but and I saw them all these other years leading up to that um, with different you know lineups and stuff it just I, I expected something more and I think it was great that they did the reunion and you know I saw it and I had a good time but I think it it was just missing that original energy I, yeah they're, they were older then I mean they're not old like that like they are now <laughs> they're really old uh, you know back then you thought oh yeah they're pretty old but now, that, that, that wasn't that old um, it really I, wasn't. I, I remember being in high school, and like my friends teasing me, "Oh, kiss, they're old." This is like ninety six, ninety seven. Think <laughs> yeah. about how old they are. They're old. I'm like, yeah, look at you know, look at them now. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, it was just kind of one of those things. So, I think my feeling on how it was back then, I think I kind of just overlooked it. You know, look at my blinders on. Um, because I, I had watched bootlegs of, of the, you know, a bunch of their shows and seeing how energetic they were and then seeing what we got 
on the on the stage um, in '96 wasn't still wasn't up to par with you know what they were you know I would I'm curious love to have been no I didn't hate it I'm just saying I was just kind of no, semi disappointed looking back on it it wasn't as yeah. Yeah. No, I'm I'm just curious about you saw them on ninety six. Where did they play? Was it in San Francisco? Did they play? It was San Jose. San yeah. Jose. Yeah. Okay, so how far along was that in the, the tour? Because the reason why I'm reason why I'm asking is because I I saw them in Toronto, and from what I understand, Toronto wasn't that late into the tour. I think it was actually kind of near the start, not like not as early as what Lonnie saw. Because I think uh -huh. they went to St. Louis really early in the like tour. It was like the third show. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it was so August. I think Toronto. Yeah, I think Toronto was a bit. Uh, it was later, but I don't remember where it was in in relation to yours. Because when I saw them, they were on fire. Like that, that you could cut the the energy with a knife in mm -hmm. the sky dome. When I saw them that night, it was really good. But I can understand what you're saying August because 6th. August six was about a, about about two months in. Yeah. Or about a, month, about a month about, about about a month or so in, about six weeks in. So yeah, August yeah. 6th, okay. nineteen ninety six was Toronto. Okay, so because and they played really good. Now I can understand that maybe as time went on, maybe they started having some problems. Maybe they started having some arguments. Maybe the energy started shifting a bit. Because I know when I saw them in '97 when they played in Hamilton on the Lost Cities tour, it was a there was a definite difference I saw mm -hmm. because there was a part in the set where I think it was maybe even Rock and Roll or Night where they you know stuff was happening on stage and Ace had fallen over on it his back and i remember gene just looked at him and just shook his head and waved off his roadie and said leave him and you could tell that he was annoyed with it mm -hmm. right yeah. and i don't think they would have had that approach to it earlier on in the 96 tour. i think that because when i saw them they were very you know high-fiving they were all smiling and everything so maybe the energy has changed like when was san jose uh Lonnie? august 27th 1996 so about a, about yeah three four yeah. weeks after we saw Okay. I have a poster of it, actually, a poster for that uh, show. Hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, and maybe I didn't have the greatest seats, and that could be part of the problem. But, um, and then some guy behind me spilled his beer on us. So. Nice. Anyway, that, <laughs> that, could, that could have helped forgot it. with that. But, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I have a bootleg of it, of that concert. I haven't had it. I haven't looked at it in a long time. Uh, I want to say it was just a one camera Thing, and the guy zooms in and, you know some of it's mm -hmm. closer to me I'll have to look I have to look at it again I mean it's again it's not bad it just didn't live up to what they were yeah. saying that, that it was going to be you know 77 yeah and, and don't forget too you you know 79 you saw the band you know and with, yeah, the, with yeah. the original guys and a yeah. huge dynasty tour so I mean and it, don't forget too you were a lot younger you know, it was your first oh, yeah. show. You're really, really impressionable. So yeah, to you, it could have yeah. that show could have been right. in your mind seventeen He's, times bigger than it was. Correct. Yeah. He probably built that up in his mind so much in seeing Kiss in '79 that they announced the reunion tour, and Ken's like, "It's just going to be as great as it was when I was a kid." Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it, but again, then if you go to like Creatures. That was so much energy on that sucker. Uh, mm -hmm. It was it was amazing. Um, so that energy wasn't there anymore. At least I know it was a different band because they had Eric Carr and, and Vinny. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the the energy level was just a little bit. I mean, again, I know there's like Andrew from you know Andrew from our podcast. Um, mm -hmm. He loves that era. That's his era. Um, and mm -hmm. probably thinks of it a lot different than how I view it, you know, from my mm -hmm. standpoint. But again, it wasn't bad. It just didn't have that energy that uh, I would have liked a little bit more energy on the show. I mean, I enjoyed it again. I enjoyed it. It wasn't like crazy nights where it was just really, uh, you know, going through the motions at on that show. Uh, so mm. anyway, there you go. That was <laughs> that was mine. <laughs> Went way very into, very uplifting topic yeah <laughs> yeah i know um any more or should we do you think we should wrap it up um do you think lonnie or jim's gonna get mad if we run along <laughs> i don't know well, i don't know i mean how much no 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 done i think we're good i i think that's it we you know we met pretty we're much keep them around an hour yeah, yeah we try to keep it around an hour because we don't want you guys falling asleep out there um so 
let us know, you know, your, your moments where you've changed your opinion on Kiss, you know, that you had a, one opinion, just like, you know, Lonnie's opinion. Maybe a good one instead of all our down. Yeah, no, no downer <laughs> ones. Maybe maybe an uplift when you went from a started from a down, you and then you like went up. You go, oh, that was it. You know, yeah. um, I guess it could I could have done that too. Uh, I probably should have. <laughs> but uh, and then also on the you know ghost musicians, uh, what you know any yeah. particular ghost musician you know Dick Wagner or whoever. Yeah, um, there's a few of know, them. Yeah. Because you, you now compare those solos, you like, well, I like the Dick Wagner. Well, because we've heard it all our life, you know, and then mm -hmm. sometimes you hear a different solo. It's not, I never played that. You know, just, you're not going to like it because <laughs> she's not used to it. So, but yeah, let us know and put it on the board or put it on, you know, the YouTube comments and, and so on. So, so we're going to wrap it up and thank you for joining us once again. Maybe Julian will be next, here next week. I hope so. Because <laughs> someone needs to. <laughs> Keep I'm, us in line and run the show. I'm sure the listeners probably hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and we might be fired by uh, after this episode too. So uh, thanks again for joining and uh, we'll catch you next time. It's been a long time since we've rock and rolled, but that all changes this August as Rock and Pod returns to Nashville. This annual convention brings together rock artists, fans, and podcasters for an unforgettable rock experience. Special guests this year include Billy Sheehan, Ron Keel, Don Jameson of That Metal Show, and current and former members of Winger, LA Guns, Accept, and more. Stage panels, signing sessions, and photo ops will be available, plus lots of vinyl and memorabilia vendors. Music podcasters from all over North America will be appearing on site for live interviews, speaking sessions, networking, and more. Got a music podcast? Register and join us. Rockin' Pod Weekend kicks off with a pre-party featuring former Tesla guitarist Tommy Skeo and his new band Resist and Bite making their debut performance as well as a rare hair set featuring surprise guests performing all-time classics. Rockin' Pod Weekend takes place August 6th through the 8th in Nashville, Tennessee. Tickets, VIP passes, podcast registration, and discounted hotel rooms are available now at rockandpod.com. Rock and Pod is brought to you by DBG Productions, Bradley Entertainment, and Inceptia. Thank you for spending time listening to the Kiss FAQ podcast today. All sales are final, there are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.